right. Good evening. <clears throat> this is the Living Water live stream Bible study. My name is Bernardine Wormley Daniels, and I will be your teacher for tonight. Praise God. So as you come into the room, say hello, share the link, let people know that we are here. Praise God. Amen. Good evening, Kathy. Good evening, Gwen. Gwendolyn. Praise God. Um, it's always good to be with you guys. We hope that some other people will... Um, hey, Pastor uh, Steve. Thank you for joining. Hello to my um, cousin... Mary and my Aunt Mary. Praise God. Thank you guys for connecting tonight. Um, we are in the revelation of Christ. Praise God. We're going to give a few more people just a minute to hello to my friend Mayu in the sweltering hot sun of Arizona. <laughs> oh, she's down there roasting, y'all. Praise God. <laughs> she likes the heat. Amen. Listen, um, while we're giving people time to uh, join us, um, get your notes from last week. We did not finish them. Praise God. Get your notes from last week, and we will be continuing in that vein. We did not finish. Praise God. All right. Good evening to Loretta. Good evening to Ruth. Praise God. Glad you could join us. Amen. So listen, while people are uh, joining Look what I got in the mail today. <laughs> of course, of course, you know it's you know it's a book, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I actually saw Sid Roth interviewing um, this gentleman, and this isn't a new book. This has been out for a while, and I actually do have a copy of the Bible that this man. Um, edited called the One New Man Bible, Revealing Jewish Roots and Power. Um, it's very interesting because all of the Jewishness of the text that tends to be stripped in the, particularly in the New Testament, he puts back in so you can see it and understand. Good evening, uh, Donna. Glad you could um, be with us tonight. So I got this in the mail. Look at this. The Power New Testament. Revealing Jewish Roots. This is the fourth edition by William J. Morford. I'll share a little bit about this with you. It, you know, this I love this kind of stuff. Um, I love this kind of stuff. It's got over 1,700 footnotes. This is just the New Testament, this volume. You can see it's pretty thick. It's, um, over 1,700 footnotes. It has a 105-page glossary in the back. Um, and what he did was he worked in conjunction with Rabbi Eliezer ben Yehuda, who is a very, very important rabbi in um, Judaism. Um, he has a synagogue in um, Florida, and they spent many hours um, with the rabbi, helping him to bring some understanding to the Jewishness of numerous passages to help him to capture some of the Hebrew idioms and customs that are in the text that we oftentimes miss. And um, so it's interesting because like I say all the time, Jesus was and still is um, he, a Jewish uh, rabbi, mess, uh, uh, Messiah, okay? And so you have to understand the cultural context in order to understand the meaning. That's true even 
of the book of Revelation, one of the reasons why people oftentimes miss it is because they don't understand it in its cultural context. And so there are little, just to give you a teaser, um, you're, you're familiar with the Beatitudes, right? The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, that, that whole thing. Okay, look at this. They translate it, instead of blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the repentant, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then they give you a note letting you know that the expression poor in spirit is a Hebrew idiom that means repentant. That's worth, that's worth the, the purchase of the book. <clears throat> Somebody asked me where I got it from. That is a good question. Where did I get it from? It came in the mail today. I want to say I went directly to his website. Um, go to try the power New Testament dot com the power new testament dot com see if you can find it there um matter of fact um I, you know me i ordered it and i ordered two i got two <laughs> um i don't know who i'm gonna give the the other one to i'll have to find a pastor friend and give it to another pastor sew it into the oh you know what I should send it to um, my pastor friends in Mississippi. Yeah, Pastor Steve, do you have this book? If you don't, I'm going to send you one. That's what I'm going to do. I just got it in the mail today. So if you don't have it and you're still watching, let me know if you have it or not in the comments, and I will send it to you. I have two of them. Um, anyway, it, there's lots of interesting things in there. Um, let me see one more and then we're going to jump into the text because I got a lot of interesting things to tell you in the book of the revelation. Okay. Look at this. Okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They translate it as blessed are the repentant poor in spirit being a Hebrew, an idiom. Blessed are those who mourn. That's the same. Um, blessed are the lowly, they, they say blessed are the humble, um, and they say that humble is a Hebrew idiom for the faithful remnant. Okay, Pastor Steve, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, let's see, uh, uh, go into my um, message thing on Facebook and give me the address where you want me to send it, um, and, I'll, and I'll send it out tomorrow. Um, there's another one that I wanted you to see. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, is that it? Maybe that's it. Um, and then there was another one. I think it's in the book of Revelation, actually, that we're, we're studying. Oh, oh, it was the concept of baptism, okay? Um, like this Sunday coming up is Pentecost Sunday. And so have you ever thought about how on Pentecost Sunday um, they were able to um, baptize 3,000 people? <laughs> you know how they do that? Well, they talk about that from that narrative and anywhere you see the word baptize and then they have a whole section on it and they talk about how, you know, the Jewish people had been practicing immersion for over a thousand years before the birth of Christ. So there were lots of mikvahs, which were the pools that you use for ritual cleansing. If you ever go to Israel, like when we went to Israel, they took us to some of the like ruins of the sites where the Essenes and some of the people who were more like desert <clears throat> spirituality, lots of mikvahs for immersion, immersion, or cleansing. <clears throat> and so one of the things that he says is that on the day of Pentecost or the Feast of Shavuot, there were 
multiple mikvahs around the Temple Mount area, which is where Jesus and the um, uh, disciple, not Jesus, where the disciples, Peter and the disciples were gathered. Um, I know some people say they were in an upper room. Um, I don't know that I believe, and I know when you go to Israel, they'll take you to these kind of places. Oh, this is like the upper room. Um, historical uh, evidence says that there were very few people that had a home that you could fit 150, 120 people in, in one room that where they were, the house was again an idiom for the temple and that where they were gathered was what was referred to as Solomon's porch where you could get thousands of people, which is why thousands of people experienced this miracle and were baptized. And how did they baptize them? There were mikvahs everywhere. And what the people did is when they repented, they immersed themselves while the preacher was preaching. Like for instance, John the Baptist, you know, um, at the Jordan River, they say that historically what was probably happening was John was preaching and as he was preaching and people were convicted by the message, they went into the water and they were baptized. They immersed themselves. If the individual actually did it personally, what they did is you immersed yourself by going down under the water they put their hands on your head to offer some resistance um, in your coming back up out of the water so that the resistance represented your dying to self. I thought that was very interesting. And so what they say is from a Hebraic perspective on the day of Pentecost, you could have baptized, more than 3,000 people could have gotten baptized in less than 20 minutes. I thought I would just share that with you. The power of New Testament revealing Jewish roots. Okay. That's for those of you who love to read like I do. Praise God. Okay. Let's pray. And we're going to jump into, um, we're going to jump into um, the book of Revelation. So let's pray. Father, thank you for um, this sacred assembly, the Ecclesia. <laughs> your beloved people gathered together in many different places, but one in spirit, one in heart, to break open the bread of life, to eat your word, to drink from life-giving rivers of the waters of your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness to meet us here in this place. Um, um, uh, brood over the top of the word. Um, place it in our hearts like precious seed. Breathe on it with the fire of your presence that it might be rooted within us and expressed in and through our lives. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We bless your holy name. Um, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Uh, your notes from last week. Uh, look like this. It says, review the seven seals. It says part 12. You know what? I don't think I posted part 13. If we get that far um, into chapter eight, then I will um, put it out there after we're done so you can you can um, grab them, okay? All right, so we are in uh, Revelation um, uh, chapter seven, I believe. So real quick, we talked about Christ the Lamb opening the seals. We said it's set in motion, um, the things that will bring about the end of human history. We said the scroll is not completely open until the seventh seal is broken. We went through a reminder of, um, hey Claudia, um, we went through a reminder of what the seals, you know, from um, one perspective, um, that of the end of the age ministries, um, Irvin Baxter, who went on to be with the Lord, 
Um, this is his, his interpretation, which I find very interesting. Um, we have already established that, you know, there are many in the church who think that the church is going to be raptured at the beginning of what's referred to as Daniel's 70th week and that believers are not going to be here. I just don't know how they can read the book of Revelation and come to that conclusion because clearly there are believers on the earth when these things begin to happen. We know, of course, they, the pre-trib camp, they reconcile it by saying these are the tribulation saints. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you like I've been telling you for weeks. You just need to live ready. So, but when you look at these things and lay them out against human history, it makes you go, hmm, because some of these seals, or let me turn that off. Some of these seals have been broken or we believe have been broken. Um, you'll find that even um, some of the trumpets you know, have been blown and you still hear. Okay, so let's look at it. We said that seal one could release, um, hey Jerome, uh, we said that seal one could release um, or, or releases the white horse and the rider. We said that it could be Catholicism. You would have to go um, um, to my YouTube channel where I, where I keep all of the old videos and watch all of that because I just cannot go back into all the details as to why that makes sense, but you'll find that it does. Seal 2 releases the red horse and rider, communism. Seal 3 releases the black horse and rider, capitalism. Seal 4 releases the chloros, green horse, Islam. And so then we, we went over all of that. We asked, could, um, when you see the souls under the altar, could that be the start of what's referred to as the great tribulation, which is a period of time within the tribulation. And I just asked the question. I did not answer it as we simply went to scripture to show you what Jesus said and you decide for yourself because Jesus says that after the tribulation of those days, certain things would happen. So um, we, we, so we looked at all of that. So let me skip past that so that we can jump into where we were. Um, oh, we were on um, uh, chapter seven, where the 144,000 of Israel are sealed. I think that's where I left off. So I'm gonna go back to the, that first verse and we're gonna work our way through. I had a friend of mine um, who called me, another um, uh, apostle who called me um, um, after the live stream to ask me some questions about the 144,000. And I said, well, you know, let me go back and look at it. So I did some deeper research. And so I didn't want to race through that. I'm, I want to share with you what I found. So um, chapter seven, verse one, after this, I saw four angels standing at four corners um, that we said that could represent that word um, gonia in the Greek. It could mean a secret place, four corners, four strategic locations in the earth. They were holding back the four winds. That word in the Greek is not just a breeze. It is a strong, tempestuous, violent agitation or stream of air. This is violent wind. And so, but there are angels that are holding back these winds. And so um, um, he saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal, which is um, spragis. It's a hard to pronounce word in the Greek. And it means um, a signet um, as fencing in or protecting from misappropriation um, for security from Satan. That's the word that's translated as seal. We're going to see that again in a few minutes. Um, so another angel comes and he has the seal of the living God and he calls out with a loud voice to the four angels who are holding the winds, um, who have been given power to use these winds to do harm in the earth, on, on the earth and in the sea. And the angel says to them, do not harm the earth 
or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, this is very interesting because the text implies that there are servants of God on the earth during whatever this time frame is, and um, they will be sealed in the, in the metal, metal um, pond, which is a spot right between the eyes in the middle of the forehead. And he heard the number 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And so he tells them, listen, don't use the winds or these storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, typhoons, you know, don't release these winds um, until we have sealed the servants of our God. So the above, the, the, um, the scriptures that we're going to look at in Revelation 7 could be letting us know that God's, remember numbers are very symbolic and prophetic in scripture, okay? So this doesn't necessarily have to represent a literal number, but rather the fullness. You know what, wait one time, wait one second. It's 12 tribes, um, 12 tribes, uh, and the, those 12 groups times a thousand, the, the number is the number for completeness. Well, let me just do some math real quick before I make this statement because I could be wrong. So let me look. Let me um, real quick. Okay, no, that won't work. Okay, um, so it has to do with completeness. So let's look at this. Um, Revelation 7 and verse 4 reveals the 144,000 are from the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. It represents completeness, the completeness, the name. And I heard the number of them which were sealed and they were sealed at 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Revelation 7 verses 5 through 8, let me open my Bible there, um, tells us um, where exactly the 12 out of each tribe are out of, you know, which tribes there are that are sealed. Now, let me look up something real quick that I didn't think about until now. Because I think it'll be um, very interesting to find. Oh, this is interesting. Okay. So look at this. Um, it speaks of th this number, this is one perspective, speaks of God raising up sons and daughters who carry fully his image and his likeness. This is one of the um, interpretations out of the Passion Translation. Some of the stuff he says is kind of like, hmm. But this, I think, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So let's look at it. So that's coming from uh, Brian Simmons, I think is his name. Let's look at, let's look at what he says about this, this passage. So this number, 144,000, 12 times 12 times a thousand, um, 12 is the number for like government, completeness, authority, like in the earth, God raising up sons and daughters who fully, um, carry his image and his likeness. Now, just think about this for a second. Um, there are some who don't really look at this interpretation that I'm getting ready to give you because they don't think the church is going to be here, but let's suppose that it is, okay? Um, this is not meant to be a literal head count. This is one perspective, but it is showing us instead who they are and drawing upon the prophetic revelance of who they are because naming has to do with identity, okay? So it could be the number of Christ multiplied in his sons and daughters coming into the likeness of the son, the completeness of the image of Christ coming into his, his sons and daughters as they mature into the likeness of the son. I don't think this is in your notes. I think I added this. This is in my notes. So you'll have to write this stuff down. 
So look at this, write this either in your notes or in the margin in your Bible. The names of the tribes speaks to the virtue associated with their names. So it becomes a progression of our spiritual life from one tribe or one identity to another or grasping one identity, growing into the next from glory to glory, from faith to faith, that type of thing, a progression. Just like um, if you look at the what we call the Beatitudes, when I teach that, I teach it as a progression as well. It starts with repentance. Blessed are the poor in in um, spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It starts right there. And as you work through, you you are, it's a progression of mature. Pretty soon you get to the point where um, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Well, that won't happen until there's repentance. You go through some steps. So this list of names could be the same thing. It could speak of a progression in our spiritual life from one level to the next, from one tribe to another, which the tribe representing like a spiritual space or a mantle that you put on. This is very interesting because one of the things that you will notice if you pay attention is that um, um, Dan is missing. I think the tribe of Dan Oh, one second, guys. <laughs> one second. Um, let me see if I can find. Just, just, just put in your mind that Dan means judgment. Okay, <clears throat> let's put that in, on the blackboard in our in our um, head. Twelve tribes of Israel. Let me see if I can um, find them in order. <coughs> Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Okay, yeah. Dan is missing from the list. Now, isn't that interesting? particularly because I said, let's look at this as a picture of the maturity of the body of Christ, including Israel, the, those who believe in Yeshua as Messiah, um, because we're engrafted into the vine because, you know, because of God's covenant with Abraham, we are the spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. So this is a reference to us as well. Are you guys with me? And so um, notice what is conspicuous in its absence from the text is the tribe of Dan. Dan meaning judgment. So judgment is removed from us because we are in the family. We are sons and daughters of the king. You ought to be glad that Dan is missing from the list. So look at this. It says in verse 5, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were um, sealed, or 12 times a thousand. Um, oh, I don't have my books like at my fingertips. That, that book is in the other room. But those numbers are significant, okay? Um, um, Judah, what does Judah mean? Judah means praise. Um, what, another thing to note is that Reuben was the firstborn. Normally the, the firstborn is first on the list. But in this case, that's not the case. Why? Because Judah goes first. Praise goes first. So if we're going to be a victorious people, particularly in a time of tribulation and even great tribulation, Judah must go first. Are you guys out there? That was an aha moment. <laughs> that was an aha moment. Judah, Judah goes first. Reuben is usually listed first, but not here. Judah is the spiritual head of Israel because praise goes first. So the first characteristic of a disciple of Christ, 
should be an attitude of praise. Boy, I felt that. Praise and reverence and awe for the Lord. Because praise takes you to the next level, which is 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben's name means behold a son. <laughs> That's so good. That gave me goosebumps. Once we see and receive Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah and begin to praise him, that begins a transformation in our hearts so that when God looks at us, he says, behold a son. <laughs> Come on, guys. That's, that's so good right there. Then 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, that word, Gad means troop. It represents the beginning of the victorious life of an overcomer who is breaking forth like a troop. Gadites were warriors. So as we are being mantled to go through the what's happening in the last days, it all starts with praise. And as we learn how to praise him, regardless of what's happening in and around us and in the earth, because he is worthy, our praise is not contingent upon um, 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 what's happening in our life. Our praise is contingent upon who he is and he does not change. So Judah goes first. And as we learn how to walk in awe and reverence of him, praising him, we are clothed in the mantle of a son, trans we're being transformed into the son, the huias, the mature sons and daughters of the king. And um, the, then we, we, we put on that, um, the, the mantle of a warrior, see, behold, the, or troop, Gad means troop, okay? Um, uh, and so, um, Gadites were warriors. It's the beginning of a victorious life. As you learn how to praise, as you become a mature son, now you're learning how to walk in victory. And then you go from there to 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. Asher means happy. You're now not just praising him because he's worthy, but you have come to walk in a place of a certain level of joy. You have broken forth into joy in spite of what's going on around you. The kingdom of God is full of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the word of God. As we, as we become overcomers, joy unspeakable and full of glory becomes our strength and our song. So we go from learning to praise him to being clothed into the, the mantle of a son. Thank you, Lord. To being a troop. Now we're learning how to overcome. We're learning how praise is our weapon. Praise becomes our victory. Our sonship becomes our weapon and our victory, which then takes us to the mental of Asher, which means happy. You know, so now we can be like even the people, um, uh, the, the New Testament church, which is in that great um, throng of witnesses that are cheering us on as we run this race, many of whom were martyrs, witnesses, and the historical record indicates that when they turned over bodies that had been mauled by lions or killed by gladiators in the, in the Roman um, games as they used Christians for sport, they turned people over. The emperors would be incensed because the Christians would have smiles on their faces, even in persecution and death. Why? Because they had gone from wearing the mantle of Judah to putting on Reuben on top of Judah and then being clothed in in a, in a troop. So even in death, they were mighty warriors and happy in, in Christ. That was worth tuning in, just that little bit right there. But there is more. 
So, okay, so write that, because uh, this isn't in your notes, it's just in the addition I put in mine. Judah means praise. Reuben means behold a son. Um, write that in your Bible next to their names. Gad means troop. You can put slash warriors. Um, Asher means happy, okay? And we go from that to 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. Naphtali means wrestling, wrestling. Um, this points to the struggle and the warfare that exists between flesh and spirit, between the natural realm and the sonship realm in the spirit. And anybody who has walked with Christ knows you can start out praising. You can hear the Lord tell you that you're a son of God, that you have become a troop. You're a warrior in the spirit. You found a certain level of joy and the enemy will turn up the, the warfare around you. The enemy will begin to um, look for the triggers in your flesh, the things that could um, disqualify you from, from being participating in, in the, these end time um, battles. Um, he looks for those things that will cause you to doubt you know, what God is doing in the earth. Like if you turn on the news, you know, and the stuff that's happening in the earth, it, it causes a wrestling, you know, like in your flesh, we begin to wrestle with who we are, with, with the call to love and the call to forgive and the call to be compassionate. So they're there. So in the midst of all of the praise and behold a son, and yes, you're a troop and there is joy unspeakable and full of glory that has become your strength, but there will be wrestling, okay? It points to the struggle and the warfare, which is real between flesh and spirit. And it reminds me, I share this with you all the time, but it reminds me of that Mel Gibson uh, movie, The Patriot, where the his son, the main character played by Mel Gibson, his oldest son has been taken prisoner by the British and so he gets his two younger sons because they know the territory and they go like um, around to um, circle around in front of the, the um, British army so that they can um, take them out and rescue his son. So he, there's, a, there's a scene which is locked in my mind where he says to his younger sons, with the, they have their rifles, he says, do you know how to identify the officers Okay, those whose uniforms mark them as leaders, or in our case, as true disciples of Christ. And the little boys say, yes, father. And he says, shoot them first. Because if you take the leader out, you can cause all kinds of disruption amongst the people, okay? If the enemy takes out the disciples of Christ, hello, Reginald. Um, if the if the if um the the enemy can take out the disciples of Christ in the earth, then he will wreak havoc in the earth. Okay, and so um, oh, it's just so interesting because in that movie, The Patriot, what Mel Gibson's character says to his sons. He says, what did I tell you about, you know, taking out, you know, the, the, the officers or how did I teach you how to shoot? And they say, aim small, miss small, aim small, miss small. So for instance, if you see an officer, you aim at a button, you aim at small, something small, a button on his uniform, because if you miss the button, <clears throat> you're still going to shoot him in the heart. Okay, so the enemy, listen, listen, guys, the enemy doesn't have to go for the big things in your life. He can, it's the little foxes that mess stuff up, okay, that ruined the vine. So that was worth you tuning in. <laughs> so, 
It's the little that the enemy will aim for the little things in your life. And the wrestling begins because you have been praising God and you're a son and a troop and you found a place of joy. And then here comes the devil on your job or in your home or wherever you, you somebody on the road. Man, today I had to go into you know, um, the church and just all the crazy drivers. There was this one, one girl, young woman, had all her windows down. She was clearly on her phone, you know, weaving, I mean, just her car drifting, about to cause an accident. I'm like, let me get away from her because I was behind her and she was driving back. So I get in the fast lane, zip up to get past her to get away from her because she gonna cause an accident. Well, she didn't like that. She gonna speed up, go around, speed up. Not so that she could hurry and get where she was going, <clears throat> but so that she could keep me behind her. <laughs> so she speeds up and then cuts off the front end. I'm telling you, that kind of stuff, for me, that causes the wrestling. <laughs> that makes me wanna run people over. In my big red truck, I wanted to run her little gray car over. But I did not do that, people, praise God. So there's a struggle <laughs> between the flesh and the spirit. But we keep going because we, 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 we know how to wrestle. Christ is with us. It leads us to 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh is a picture of um, um, the believer entering into a certain realm Praise God, you did not mean in Facebook today, whatever. Manasseh means causing me to forget, causing me to forget. What does that have to do with us in a time of tribulation or great tribulation? It lets us know, this is the Lord, lets us know that as we learn how to walk a lifestyle of praise, we become a son. We're clothed in the mantle of a warrior. We're a troop. Um, right. Um, we, we learn how to be happy, you know, unspeakable joy and glory. The wrestling starts, but that's okay. If we press through the wrestling, we put on the garment of Manasseh, which is causing me to forget. What that means is there is a realm of grace where we forget the pain of our struggles, the pain of betrayal, and we enter into the vibrant, victorious life of Christ. Come on, come on. <laughs> That's right, Pastor Steve, hear my confession, praise God. Confession is good for the soul. So listen, if we press past the crazy drivers, if we press past the madness that is going on in the earth, we put on Manasseh, which is we enter into a realm of grace. Boy, I felt that. There, this one has oil on it, where we forget the pain of our struggles. We forget the pain of betrayal, and we enter into the vibrant, victorious life of Christ, where we begin to say, devil, that's not going to work today. I will forgive my enemy. I will forgive those who intentionally hurt and be and and betray me. I will forgive those who attack me. I will um, minister compassion and mercy and great. Listen, that takes that takes everything, all the levels we just went through. Look at this: as we press past that, we put on the garment of Simeon. Simeon. Uh, his name means a hearing ear or one who hears. So now as we learn how to walk victoriously, we've, we've pressed through the wrestlings, which, and these things may cycle over and over as we go through tribulation. It's a picture of how we, we, we um, um, enter into the fullness of victory, see, as we press past the wrestling and we enter into that realm of grace where regardless of what the enemy throws at us, it may land, it may cause pain, but it will not stick. 
and we we take on the mantle of one who has a hearing ear now we have drawn to a place where our hearts and our minds are more attuned to the voice of the lord than the distractions in the earth we are more attuned to the voice of the lord than the distractions in the earth we know how to filter out our reticular activating system is so radically focused on the lord our savior our bridegroom king that we can filter out the 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 the, the grumblings and the the craziness of the enemy we're clothed in Simeon. And from there, we go, that was good. Isn't that good? <clears throat> that is good. Then we go from there to the mantle of the tribe of Levi, which means joined or union, as we refuse to worship the beast and his system as we refuse to be partakers of one world religion, we refuse to reject Christ. <clears throat> as we refuse to participate in the insanity that the enemy throws our way. If he hits us and we get knocked down, we get up. You know, we may fall, but we get back up. And when we get back up, we put back on Judah and begin to praise God. We, we put back on Reuben, I'm still a son. We put back on our warrior clothes, I'm a troop. We put back on the joy of the Lord. We, we press through the wrestling. We enter into a realm of grace. We open our ears again to hear the Lord. And we are joined or in union with the Lord because we will not bow down to the enemy. We refuse. We would rather lay our life down for the one our heart loves, worships, and adores the one to whom we are betrothed. We go from Levi to the garment of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. Issachar's name means reward or compensation. In our union with Christ, <clears throat> we have an unbreakable certainty that there is a reward for his faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to him. There is a reward. There is compensation on this side of eternity. Even if that compensation is simply the warmth of his embrace, the weight of his glory as he comes upon us, the sound of his voice, the vision of his face, face the you know the, <clears throat> the 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 sweetness of his word as we open the book of the bread of life and drink deep from rivers of living water there is a reward and compensation i'm telling you hey my aunt martha and my cousin linda are here praise god whoop whoop that's good stuff. Glad you guys are here. My Aunt Martha and my Aunt Mary, who is on all the time, are twin sisters. They're my dad's um, younger sisters, praise God. Um, okay, so where were we? we um, we're at the place, there's reward and compensation. And then look, people, every obedient son and daughter will be rewarded. That's just good to know. So look at this. Then we, we put on the next mantle, the next level, which is the garment of Zebulun. Zebulun means dwelling or habitation. Now I was thinking about this as I was putting these notes together because years ago when I was pastoring um, um, Yale United Methodist Church up in the Thumb and the parsonage was a really beautiful home. The master bedroom had this 
large closet and then it had an additional walk-in closet that was a part of the master bedroom and it was literally <clears throat> like the size of a small bedroom <laughs> you know and so i had turned that into my prayer closet i had a cork board um, board, um, wall. I put cork board on one of the walls in there where I would pin up pictures and people's prayer requests. I had my kneeler where I would kneel and pray. I had my communion stuff. I had a recliner chair, which was like my prayer chair. I had my, my, my thing that I did face down praying. And I would go in that closet literally and spend time in, in, in prayer, praying in the spirit, praying with the spirit, that type of thing. And one day, I, and I could not figure out what this meant. And actually, when I was studying for tonight's class, I just had an aha moment because I was laying there one day and as clear as day, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me in a clear audible voice, you are Zebulun. And I was like, Zebulun? I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. Listen, that's so good. That's giving me goosebumps. <clears throat> Here's what that means. You are one who is clothed in the garment of Judah and Reuben. You are a huihas, a son a da and daughter, a mature child of God, a troop who knows how to war, You who, who has embraced, you know, unspeakable joy and full of glory becomes our strength <coughs> and our son. You have gone through wrestlings and come through. The enemy knocked you down, but you got back up. He knocked you down, but you got back up. And you slipped into a place clothed in Manasseh where you have entered a realm of grace, where you have forgotten the pain and the struggles and the betrayal and are entering into a more vibrant um, um Life in Christ, you have a hearing ear. You are Levi joined or in union. You have put on the garment of Issachar. Reward and compensation is yours. You are Zebulun. Come on, how many of you want to be Zebulun? Zebulun is the dwelling or the habitation of the Lord. As we pass through these stages, in the midst of tribulation and great tribulation, we can put on the garment of Zebulun as we pass through the other stages. We become a people who are his habitation. Yet, so when we come together, <clears throat> can you imagine what happens when you get a group of people in difficult times who know how to pass through those 12 stages and they get to the level of Zebulun? Come on, people. When we come together, you're a dwelling. You're a dwelling. I'm a dwelling. He's a dwelling. She's a dwelling. My my tribe down in Mississippi, they are a dwelling. When so when we come together, what happens? There is a the habitation of God. There's a, there is the glory of God. You know, in your home, in my aunt Martha's home, in my aunt Mary's home, Zebulun, the dwelling, the habitation. Come on. In the, those of you who are who are watching, you know, um, my cousin Claudia, praise God. That's just so good. And you know what? Here's what here's how the enemy defeats us. We're reading through the book of Revelation, <clears throat> and we just pass, we just skip over th this this part in chapter seven. Oh, because we don't understand it. We never thought to look up the meaning of the names. It's just so good. And so listen, as we become clothed in Zebulun, we pass on into the next level, which is 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. Now we put on the mantle of Joseph. Come on. You know what that means? It means may he add another. So here's what it means. There's something in us as we become the habitation of God, our hearts become 
um, inflamed with a passion to share the word of God and to birth other sons and daughters. We become Joseph. May he add another. Even as Christ has brought forth many sons, may we in Christ bring forth an abundant harvest of sons. We look at the news and instead of seeing stupid people who are making stupid decisions, we see a harvest of people who need an encounter with the living Christ. And we see ourselves as the bearer of that good news because we are the dwelling place. We are Zebulun, Issachar, Levi. Come on, just go through the list. And then look, what does it say in verse number eight? From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 having been sealed, sealed. Come on, that word, that means that he, he marked us with, with, with the, the capability of being the fullness of these things. Benjamin means son of my right hand. <laughs> that is so good through the travail of our difficulty. So you're going through a difficult time. Get to the back of the line. We all going through a difficult time. We have been going through. If you have not been going through, I don't know where you live, but most of the people on the planet have been going through. But through the travail of our difficulties, through our, listen, go back. Through our praise, <laughs> through our praise, through our becoming a son, through us picking up our warriors and becoming a troop, through us breaking through like a warrior, through our learning how to be happy in the midst of the difficulty, through our wrestling, and maybe we got knocked down a couple of rounds, but we got back up and we enter into a causing us to forget that level of grace. Our ears are open. We're joined with him in union. The reward or compensation of that level of perseverance is beginning to be made manifest in our hearts and our lives. We become Zebulun, the dwelling or the habitation of God. And then our hearts begin to burn for the harvest, for the harvest. We want to bring forth more sons and daughters for the king. And as we come to that level of longing, we are positioned at his right hand through the travail of our difficulties. A true son or daughter, a huias, it's an inclusive term of God's right hand comes forth. We are a privileged people sitting enthroned with Christ at the right hand of God. That was worth you tuning in tonight. That was just so good. I'm so glad that um, Apostle Tanya Roberson called me and asked me for further insight on these 12 tribes. So I had to dig and do some study because that's so good. You know what? I will, um, I'll post the updated notes on my, on my Facebook page, but you should have been writing those meanings down <laughs> in your Bible, you know, like in the margin in Revelations chapter seven. Okay. Moving on, moving on. That was so good, man. That'll, that'll preach. So just for your contemplation. So we have to ask as we read Revelation, who will be affected by the pouring out of the wrath of God? So now, see, here's the question. People who, again, have a pre-trip theology don't believe the church is going to be here. I don't know. I think it's some be some people here clothed in everything that we just described. But let's say you're here. Just let's just suppose. Who's going to be affected by the pouring out of the wrath of God? Because the church there people say, well, that the, the you know the rapture is going to occur um before the tribulation because we're not subject to God's wrath. Okay. When God pours out his wrath, who's going to be affected? 
It's not hard. The answer is in the Bible. Could the breaking, this, these are just questions. These are just things for us to think about. Could the breaking of the seventh seal, which initiates the trumpets and the bowls and vials, which there are some um, scholars who believe those are all the same thing. They're described over and over and over again in different ways in the book of Revelation. We'll see as we read. But when um, could the breaking of the seventh seal occur after the end of De Daniel 70, 70th week? Could the breaking of the seventh seal happen after the great tribulation period? Meaning, meaning this is just a question. Could the wrath of God come after the end of the great tribulation? Because why? Okay, why? Hold, hold, hold that thought. And remember, <laughs> I just love the word of God. I, re I Wait, let me see. Okay, remember Matthew 24 and verse 29, where the, the disciples have asked the Lord to explain to him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? You know, when will you? And so he says to them, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and he begins to give them some descriptions regarding his coming after. Now, I didn't say it. Don't get mad at me. What you can do is you can get you some white out, and you can white out Matthew 24, verse 29, and all of that stuff in Matthew. Matter of fact, you could just rip Matthew 24 out your Bible if you want. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you that's what Jesus said. So could the breaking of the seventh seal and the wrath of God come after the great tribulation? Meaning there's going to be some difficulty and some stuff that's going to be happening. But listen, beloved, if you got your clothes on, Tell your neighbor, somebody put in the chat, keep your clothes on. <laughs> if you are clothed in Judah and Reuben and Gad and Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh and Simeon and Levi and Issachar and Zebulun and Joseph and Ben Hamin, if you got your clothes on, you going to be all right. Okay? So, could the wrath of God keep your clothes on? Thank you, Kathy. Um, who, could the wrath of God come after the great tribulation? You know, who, who, who's, thank you, Pam. <laughs> who, who's going to um, be subject to the wrath of God? Look at this. Revelation 16, real quick, let's jump ahead and then look back. Verses 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. And who did his bowl, what was in his bowl, who did it hit? And it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. <clears throat> so listen, people, when you read the scripture, sometimes you have to ask, what is conspicuous in its absence from the text? So in this case, it tells us that the first bowl or the first vial, the people that are affected by it will be the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. What it means, what it implies is that those who did not take the mark, those who do not worship the beast will not have what's in that bowl poured on top of their head. Are you guys, you guys out there, <laughs> listen, let's just, we just, we're just reading it. Okay. We're, we're reading it outside of any denominational influence and we're simply letting the word speak to us and we'll see where we come out on, on the back end. 
This passage says in, in Revelation 16, we still got our finger in Revelation 7, but it tells us that people who take the mark of the beast, who worship the Antichrist and his world government image are the people who will be the recipients of the wrath of God. God, the, those who say that God will not subject his people to wrath, that's true. God will not pour out his wrath upon his people. He will pour his wrath out on those who have pledged allegiance to the Antichrist and received the mark of the beast. Now, we could really go somewhere <laughs> in talking about that, but we haven't gotten to that chapter yet. I will just say this, don't take the mark, okay? Just don't take it. All right, so um, it is so, and listen, if you are clothed, if you got your clothes on, and you're walking in that, that coming through those, those progressions that we just looked at, you're going to be okay. All right. All right. Look at this. So it is important to understand that the pouring out of these bowls and these vials do not affect everybody. They affect those who have taken the mark of the beast and worship the antichrist. Can you see that? Can you see that in the text? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Where am I? Um, oh, so, so now oh, how much time I got? Okay. I got time. Look at this. An example of this, because there's always show it to me in the world. Okay. Okay. Let's look, <laughs> let's look. An example of this can be found in the old Testament when the plagues of Egypt were being poured out on the Egyptians. Now, this is so good. Okay, look, go, keep your finger in, oh, let me get a marker. Keep your finger in Revelation 7, but flip over to the book of Exodus, <laughs> chapter 6. We're going to start at chapter 6. Oh, I just love it. I love it when the word of God makes sense. Wait one second. No, 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 no. I take that back. Exodus chapter 7. Okay. Exodus chapter 7. So look at this. An example of this is found when the plagues of Egypt were poured out on the Egyptians. Or you could say the bowls, the vials in that particular um, time in human history. The Israelis lived there. But all the plagues did not affect them like they affected the Egyptians outside the land of Goshen. Listen, people, just like you on the planet now, and you are in Christ, I'm assuming, if you're watching me, you, you are in Christ, or you want to be, praise God. So you're on the planet, the recession that's happening, it's being poured out on the earth or on the United States, and it will affect you. Not like it will affect the Egyptians, but you hear. So when, when God really starts reading, God will protect his people. He protects his people. Okay. Um, oh, let's, let's look at it in, in Exodus. So look at Exodus 7. The first plague... Um, is the water turned to blood, okay? And um, the Nile River is overflowing with blood. And so God tells Moses, take your staff, stretch your hand out over the waters of Egypt, that's in verse 19, over their rivers, over their pools, over all their reservoirs, that they may become blood. There will be blood throughout the land of Egypt both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And so that's what happened. So that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, okay? There was blood. And so you'll find that what the Egyptians began to do is they started digging around the Nile for water to drink because they couldn't drink the water of the Nile. So did Moses tell the people of Israel, listen, let me give you a heads up. 
you need to start storing some jars of water cause uh, but even the Egyptians jar there the stuff they had stored turned to blood I think that it didn't affect the Israelites like it did the, like it did the Egyptians and here's why let's let's keep going look at this in in Exodus chapter 8 where the second plague is the frogs okay um, verse 3 God tells them the Nile was swarmed with, with frogs. They're going to be everywhere. They're going to come into your bedroom, on your bed. They're going to be in your ovens, in your kneading bowls. They're going to come upon you and on your people and on all your servants. Okay. And so the frogs came up and covered the land. And so people had to deal with just like I go to the supermarket and a big pack of hamburger is $20. I got to pay 20 bucks like the Egyptians got to pay 20 bucks. But the difference is God makes sure I got 20 bucks to buy the hamburger. Okay, keep going. At a point, he's going to draw a line in the sand when it gets real bad, okay? So look, the next plague was gnats. There were gnats on man and beast. They went to flies. And look at this in, in, in Exodus 8 and verse 22. It says, but on that day, I will make a distinction for the land of, Jos of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of flies will be there, that you may know that I, Yahweh, am in the midst of the land, and I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will happen. So at this point with the fourth plague, God makes a, di a difference between the people of Israel and the people of um, Egypt. And you, it's like you could be walking down the street, flies, and you cross a line, zip, no flies, you're in Goshen. <laughs> he, made a, he made a difference, okay? Look at um, chapter 9, heavy pestilence on your livestock, livestock in the field, look at verse 4, but Yahweh will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So he drew a line. When he was pouring out these plagues on the Egyptians, it didn't touch the Israelites. Keep going with the hail. Um, uh, Moses gave the, the warning, and anybody that had good sense brought their livestock in so they wouldn't be subject to the hail, okay? If you go hanging out with the Egyptians <laughs> with all of your livestock, you might get hit with the same play. Okay, but look at this. Look at verse 26 in chapter 9. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hell. Okay? Um, uh, locusts. Locusts came through and rested on everything. Um, God made a difference between the people. You get to um, the ninth plague, darkness. Darkness was felt all over the, the, the land. Um, uh, plague number 10, that was the death of the firstborn. And the, the difference was God gave Israel the Passover. And they applied the blood. And when that 10th um, uh, plague, which was the death of the firstborn, it skipped over those who were under the blood, okay? So listen, here's the point. The point is that um, all the plagues did not affect um, the Israelites it, 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 because the people in Goshen had like um, the protection of God. So to me, it's a picture um, of what God is able to do during this time if the people of God are still here and you really do have to go through, you know, we'll see. I personally think that one of the reasons why there will be such a great apostasy is because there are a lot of people that don't think they're going to be here. And when they, when difficulty starts, people will turn away. They will depart from the faith. And just like uh, some of the epistles say their hearts will grow cold um, they'll be angry with God because they didn't think they was going to be here because they listened to some broke down preacher who barely, okay, 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 <laughs> okay, I take that back. I repent. I repent for that right there. We believe some crazy stuff and we need to learn how to read the Bible for ourselves. and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. 
because, you know, I could be wrong. Well, let's see what the text says. Let's look at chapter 7, verse 9. And after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's no specific number of people mentioned in this verse, um, and these are not necessarily um, limited to the 12 tribes. These are people from all nations, everybody, the 12, all nations, all peoples, all tongues. When John was shown the second group of people, the elders speaking asked him a question. One of the elders said, um, uh, this is in verse 13 in chapter 7, these clothed in the white robes, who are they and from where have they come? And so um, who are these clothed in white and from where? That, that, that word in the Greek is a word that means what is the origin or source? Um, from what condition did they come out of? And so uh, John responds, he's like, sir or Lord, you know, my Lord, you know. And so um, the elder says to him, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. You should circle. They came out of the great tribulation. They came out of the great tribulation. Okay, so let me just, let me just lay this out. If the church is gone and the spirit of God is, is gone, and the earth is given over to the Antichrist and the beast and tribulation and all that kind of stuff, how would anybody get saved? I'm just asking. But if there is a warring clothed in everything we just talked about, people still on the planet, then we getting ready to have a revival. Okay, I'm just saying. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in the sanctuary. And he who sits on the throne will dwell over them. They will hunger no more, thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. Man, that sounds like they went through some stuff. <laughs> they were going through some stuff prior to being with the Lord. For the lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to, spring, to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So let's look at this. Um, these are they that came out of great tribulation. I've, I just find that an interesting statement. Um, look at this. Um, the only way our robes can be white is if we wash them in the blood of the, in the, blood of the lamb. These are people who were redeemed Okay, so there clearly is still an operation of the Spirit of God in the midst of difficulty. These people had experienced the salvation of Jesus Christ and had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now remember, I asked the question, could these events be occurring after the end of the Great Tribulation? Because the Lord says that's what's going to be initiate, you know, like his coming and all of this kind of stuff. So I'm just, I'm just trying to put the timeline together. This passage foretells a great revival out of all nations that no man can number. John has already seen um, the 144,000 um, Jews or a spiritual company that are walking in the fullness of all those things we just looked at. Now he's being shown a massive Gentile revival. Maybe this revival is the result of those clothed in the fullness who are, are going forth to, to bear sons. And now we see a revival that will take place in the midst of great tribulation. There's a young man from our church who right now is over in Poland 
right near the Ukraine doing some mission work in the midst of what's happening over there. And he has sent back word that there is revival taking place in the church over there. That's what usually happens in the midst of, of tribulation, um, revival. So in the midst of this difficulty, there will be revival. And people miss it because they're so busy focused on them not being here. And oh, look at what's going to be happening. And we look, we miss the, the scripture saying, look at this host that's going to come in as a result of the, the maturity of those who are going to per persevere through whatever difficulty comes our way. Many commentaries on the book of Revelation focus on the Antichrist, on the false prophet, on all the stuff the devil is doing. And they skip right over what the overcoming church is going to be doing. You know why? Because they don't think the church is going to be here and is right there in their face. Something is happening during this time, okay? They skip right over a prophecy regarding the greatest revival that we have ever seen. Romans 5 and verse 20 says, where sin abounds, Grace does that much more abound. So yes, when you turn on your television, it looks like the world is going straight to hell and that's what's happening. So when will you and I stand up and begin to boldly proclaim the gospel concerning Jesus Christ? For we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, I'm just saying. I think I think that's in the book. Look at look at look at this. Oh, we just read that. All the angels, they fall on their faces, they're worshiping, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. The elder, who are these? We looked at that. These are the ones coming out of that's the word ek in the Greek. It's a primary preposition denoting origin. They come out of, they come from, they come by means of the great tribulation, okay? So, you know, here's what the pre-trib people do. What they do is they say, oh, well, those are the tribulation saints. The church is gone, but there's going to be a remnant that'll be saved during the tribulation, but we're not going to be here. Who's going to witness to them? Who, who, who's, who's preaching it? <clears throat> Who's preaching the gospel? <laughs> I had a friend, I had a friend years ago, a friend of mine, she was a, a minister on my, on my staff back in the day, these were back in the Exusia days. And she used to say she wanted to be here. <laughs> she wanted to be here during the tribulation so she could point, um, directions to the, the the ones that we haven't gotten we get we're gonna come to them the description of those the look the scorpions with the tails and that kind of thing she wanted to point directions to them and tell them who to go sting <laughs> that's kind of funny now because you know we she just might get to do that because we're gonna be here i think we're gonna be here anyway i could be wrong though let me give that disclaimer but we're looking at what the word of god says all right, so where are we? Let me, oh, I got to wind up. Um, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And verse 15, they are before the throne of God and they serve. This is the word la true all, la true all. And it means to minister to, to worship, to perform the sacred services, to offer gifts, to worship God in the observance of rites instituted for his worship. It describes a priestly function. So there are um, um, saints of God that are going to be performing priestly functions in the temple of God day and night to him who sits on the throne and he will shelter. That's the Greek word skin, um, skinoo, and it means to tent or encamp, to occupy as a mansion. He will indwell us and it means to reside as in the tabernacle of old. It is a symbol of protection and communion. Um, he will occupy us with his presence. Oh, I can't even begin to imagine what that's going to be like. 
They shall hunger no more, neither thirst, nor shall the sun strike them, nor any scorching, scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them. And that is a depiction of a Jewish and Gentile church coexisting. Like this guy says, one new man revealing the Jewish roots and power. That's what this power testament that I was showing you, revealing the Jewish roots. Embrace it, people. That's going to be in eternity. You know, Jew and Gentile coming together, one new man coexisting together in the end of times, just like they did with the birth of the church. Jew and Gentile coexisted together in the early church. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's what this passage says. There is as much emphasis on being sealed concerning both the 144,000, which I think is a like a type and a shadow of you know who we are in him, as well as it being a reference to like a Messianic Jewish company rising up. Um, um, but we will be sealed, Jew and Gentile alike, with the Holy Spirit. In both cases, we have provided evidence to prove that people must be sealed to be a part of the kingdom of God. The question is how, how are we sealed? Well, Ephesians 1 and verse 13 tells us, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the Greek word, sphragizo. It means to stamp. He took his signet ring and marked you right in the middle of your head for security or preservation to keep you secret, to keep you in him, to confirm that you are a true believer. It's just like those new bills, like a 20, 50, $100 bill. You hold them up and they have that kind of like that hologram thing on there. You look for the seal that shows you that it is authentic cash. Listen, that's what the enemy is looking for when he comes and throws arrows at you, depending on how he's looking for the seal of God. And after we believe the gospel, the scripture teaches Holy Spirit will seal us. The Holy Spirit seals us when we believe the gospel. So whether you can see the mark or not, you have been marked. <clears throat> Don't try to erase it off. Ephesians 4 and 30 says, and grieve not, <clears throat> do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Praise the name of the Lord. That was just good to me. I don't know about you. And so we're going to look at chapter 8, and he opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour which is interesting because there's no time it, when you're outside of eternity so time it's, it's almost like heaven and earth must be real close at that moment at that moment it opens the seventh seal and there is silence there is a pause in events the only activity at that time you have to tune in next week to find out what the answer to that is. <laughs> oh, that was mean. Okay. <laughs> you got to tune in next week. We out of time. We are out of time. Man, it's so good. It's good stuff. Okay. Next week, it's even more interesting when you start seeing these trumpets being blown. I got some interesting stuff to show you next week. God willing and the creek don't rise. We're going to be right here. You have been studying the word of God with myself, Bernardine Wormley, Daniel, Soterios Ministries Incorporated. It is my pleasure to sit with you and to break open the bread of life. It's just good stuff, guys. Be safe out there. Don't go anywhere without your clothes on, okay? Keep your clothes on. Go back down that list. Make sure you are clothed in all those dimensions of um, walking with Christ. 
and I will see you on next week. I will put in the uh, comment line how you can sow into uh, Soterios Ministries if you would like um, paypal dot, uh -oh, paypal dot me forward slash Soterios Ministries. There you go. We think this is um, this is good soil, and or you can send a donation to Cash App. If you give to any one of those places, it does not go in my pocket. It goes straight to Soterios Ministries. We use it for benevolence. We use it to be able to bring you um, cutting edge um, materials. You know these books and these things that I purchase and that I sell, um, it comes through Soterios Ministries. Um, so thank you for your support. I'll see you next week. God bless you and take care.